My guest today is Professor Joanna Drucker, who is Professor of Bibliographical Studies at UCLA. Her research interests span artist books, the history of graphic design, typography, experimental poetry, fine art, and digital humanities. Welcome, Joanna. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So as I mentioned, um, I'm a bit a fish out of water here. Um, I, I know nothing about this topic, Joanna, so I'm hoping to learn something from you today. So I want to start with one of your papers, The Ethics of Aesthetics, Visualizing uh, Catastrophe. Uh, you say in the, the late Middle Ages, European painters depicted the plague in vivid graphic terms. The skeletal figure of death mounted on the on the bones of a horse strode along, strode among the dying and corpses whose twisted bodies had already blackened with disease. The impact of these images remains strong centuries later. And you follow up with that uh, with a contemporary view <laughs> during the first phase of the COVID-19 outbreak. You said that Johns Hopkins University created a website to display statistics on infection rates and trends, refreshed on a continual basis, its rational presentation of red data points mapped on a black, <laughs> black uh, background of a sobering image of the rapid spread of the pandemic. Uh, yeah, so I, I have been a frequent visitor to the Johns Hopkins uh, statistics um, website. <clears throat> and yeah, yeah, I really liked uh, what you're talking about here. So you can use uh, graphics, depictions, statistical measures in ways to, to really kind of, kind of create emotions on a large population, right? That is, that is one of the issues that you're thinking about here. Absolutely. I, I think that one of the opportunities that we need to explore within the range of information visualization is the extent to which the rhetoric of visualization can more passionately communicate the crises and you know difficulties that we face at various moments in contemporary life. And an interesting thing occurs in the 18th century as the very beginnings of social science be start to take shape as a discourse and a discipline. And in that period, a number of very innovative graphic designers and statisticians like William Playfair, most notably, but Joseph Priestley and others, begin to develop a graphic language for translating statistical information about you know, nation states, populations, demographics into very legible visual form. And the forms are elegant, they're legible, they're beautiful, but what they tend to do is to take away the human face. They aggregate information. We see trends, we see groupings, we don't see what it means for someone to be suffering from, you know, a disease, for instance, like the plague. And it's not that, you know, we want to kind of turn all of information visualization into cartoons. You know, we don't want caricatures. We don't want to trivialize human suffering by putting, you know, images of, of people dying into the Johns Hopkins site. I mean, it's that is a terrific site and it's really well curated and it, and it does its work very well. But I think that there are aspects of just the way we use color, the way we use form, the way that, you know, affect can be really sort of, you know, produced through reaction and, and provocation to a visualization. So that paper about the eth ethics of aesthetics is also about, you know, what is it that doesn't get shown? What are the ethical issues in erasing the humanity from demographic statistics as they become produced as visualizations? Yeah. So I'm, I'm really guilty of this, Joanna. Um, uh, you know, I spent some time in statistics and finance and economics and all of that. And I'm a utilitarian to top it all off. So whenever I think about COVID-19, I think about the 18, uh, the 8 billion people that we have. And the my interest is to look at what is happening to the 8 billion people in some sort of graphical representation 
And I don't think about Sally, I don't think about John, I think about 8 billion people. Um, and so, I mean, there, there are two issues there, right? One is sort of the aggregation and statistical measures and graphical representation. And the other is, what is how does that matter to an individual? Um, I remember uh, skimming through a paper, I remember somebody sort of started off showing African Americans dying of COVID one by one, and then we got hundred by hundred, we got thousand by thousand, we got ten thousand by ten thousand. So, so what do you do there? You know, so so how do you how do you tackle this? Right. Well, that's Kim Gallon's work, Black COVID, that you're referencing, and again, it was a very um, compassion driven um, you know project in which. You know, first of all, her conviction that, um, you know, black communities were suffering much greater losses at um, a faster rate than uh, white communities was, you know, statistically true. Um, but she also wanted to, you know, sort of honor um, and recognize what these losses meant. But as you note, you know, as you begin to scale up very rapidly, what happens is compassion fatigue instead of having people register the humanity of each face, the faces begin to almost lose their humanity in, in, a, in another scale. So I don't think it's an easy problem to solve, but I do think that one of the ways in which visualizations could transform is to allow um, users to drill into them, to drill down, so that when you're looking at a statistic, then the question is, well, what do you need to know in order to understand that statistic? What are the actual lived circumstances that that statistic represents? How do we show that? So that if we're talking about 8 billion people and we're looking at a, you know, an international and global, a global pandemic and an international world, and I use those two words because the pandemic is global, but the world is international. And national boundaries really set up, you know, asymmetries of access to resources, healthcare, vaccines. So again, rather than only seeing things in, you know, sort of equivalent terms across these international boundaries, to be able to see how these statistics represent other, um, you know, inequities, um, how we begin to look into them so that you know, what does it mean to say X number of persons have this, you know, this condition? Well, you know, there's a bigger story behind that. And the statistics as currently presented make it difficult to see how those statistics are arrived at. What we see are the statistics as if each number by its quantity can be read relative to another number simply quantitatively. And I'm simply arguing that there are qualitative dimensions to the production of the statistics um, that could be shown um, in, you know, again, by using certain very, um, you know, basic graphic means, color, tone, intensity, rate of change. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so I think there are things that would, um, again, communicate, uh, again, more effectively to readers um, where, um, you know, where asymmetries exist, where interventions might make a difference. Um, you know, so uh, I guess I'm just calling for a broadening of the graphical vocabulary that uh, is more responsible to what I consider the ethical dimensions of mm -hmm presentation of information. Yes, that's really interesting, Joanna. So there are two issues. One is sort of the localization issue. Um, so if I'm sitting in Connecticut, I'm more interested in what's happening around me as sort of the first order problem to solve. And not many people, I would argue, is interested in the 8 billion people question. So the Johns Hopkins site, if I remember, shows the entire world, actually, not just the US. And not many people have the time to go there and, and really get depressed about what, <laughs> what, what, what's going on. Um, so there's a localization issue. And the other thing is what you mentioned, sort of an intervention question. So yeah, I mean, I can see the data. I can see the pictures. So what do I do about it? Right. Uh, question, right? Yeah, I think one of the questions that um, is really absolutely essential to ask is how do individual choices within those local environments 
have some kind of consequence within the interlinked networks of global exchange and across, you know, the international border boundaries of different nation states. So, you know, I, it, the, there are very definite um, implications and consequences for every choice we make. Um, and so, you know, wh where, who makes decisions about where resources are distributed? How, how are these decisions made? What is the input of individual individuals within a community to the decision making processes? And so even within a local community, understanding what's the access to test sites, what's the access to vaccines, where are they accessible, what are the obstacles to access, who is able to get transportation and not get transportation to those sites. It's, it's a lot like voting. You know, how do we understand the voting process? Well, it is, you know, mediated through a whole set of contributing factors and points of intervention can be strategically mobilized um, in order to make a difference in what the, um, you know, degrees of access might be. Right. And orthogonal to this is sort of a design question. I think you're talking about this too, um, which is uh, going back to Johns Hopkins site, um, having big red dots in a black background <laughs> uh, has an effect, as you say, on, on societal psyche, right? So there, there's sort of a design question around this too, right? Yeah, I mean, look, they're very legible graphics on some level and, you know, but um, it's always nighttime. And, you know, so we've got this, this dark world, it's all unified as one graphic. Um, I don't know about your experience of the globe, but I do not believe it is ever nighttime everywhere on the earth. <laughs> and um, and then there, you know, there are, you know, fundamental issues of, you know, the, the nature of area when you're using circular forms and how that transforms in relationship to quantitative transformations and so forth. Um, and, you know, so uh, again, the, the challenge that a site like Hopkins um, site is, is addressing is huge, right? I mean, constantly, you know, it's refreshed every day. It has, you know, I think 280 or 270 um, data sources. Um, each of these is authoritative in some degree or other. Um, and, you know, it's like trying to figure out how do you show um, all of this information in a way that, you know, gives somebody a sense of, you know, how to read it and make sense of it. Um, you know, it's it's not easy, but I think scale becomes very difficult to gauge when you're only seeing it flat. Scale is something that when you see it in height and depth, becomes much more dramatic and, you know, much more meaningful. And again, just basic things like rate of change. How fast? How fast are things changing? Also, what are the networks of transmission and exchange? Right. You know. Yeah, so, so I think scientists and engineers think in a particular way. Uh, till I read your read your uh, piece, I didn't think there was anything wrong wrong with Johns Hopkins. Uh, oh, <laughs> I don't want to say that. I mean, I think very highly of these folks. I yeah. use it because it's such a good example. But the question is, what are the possibilities? for more effective communication right. of complex systems. These are complex systems. They are not linear, they're not predictable, and they have many variables in them that we don't get to see in those presentations that are relevant to the decisions that I think we make in relationship to the decisions being made by people in positions of what used to be called leadership. Um, <laughs> we had you know but but seriously um you know the decision making processes um that are essential for you know really transforming the outcomes of these uh crises yeah so with with artificial intelligence in the wings as you know um history is interesting but what's more interesting is what's going to happen tomorrow um and if you can do that properly, then there's sort of a, a very interesting design question. How do you show? So this is sort of what, you, what you're talking about, which is, you know, how is it changing? Right. And how it is expected to change are things that people could utilize in the decision making processes. So I can look back into history and see all the data and all the pictures. I can make any decisions based on history. 
I can only make decisions based on the future, right? Absolutely. But again, our visualization techniques do not include a lot of speculative possibilities. It's very difficult to build in a what if scenario into yeah. current visualizations. So, for instance, I live in California. We have a little challenge here, which is called water. And it's, you know, the, the, and, and we're not alone in having a challenge about water, but water, the water systems as currently, you know, administered are not sustainable and they will not sustain either the economy or the ecology or the, you know, culture of California. And so the New York Times uh, did a, an article not too long ago on the Colorado River, which is one of our major water sources except for when water falls from the sky, which happens occasionally. And um, so the, the article contained a very interesting statement. I don't know if it's true or not, but it suggested that if all Americans, every person in America simply did not eat meat one day a week, that the Colorado River water would suffice for sustaining California's economy, you know, for the foreseeable future. Mm. Now, that's a very dramatic statement. Um, yeah. I don't happen to eat meat, so I'm all in favor of this. Um, but, and, but most people do not realize the extent to which um, resources around food production have direct you know, projection forward um, you know, outcomes. So we need, I think, um, you know, some really handy like, you know, app type tools where you can kind of at any moment in your daily activity kind of do a what if scenario. What if I don't, you know, take three trips this week in my car? What if I don't, you know, decide to buy X piece of fast, fast fashion? What if I don't decide to do X or Y? What's that look like in terms of impacts it might have? And so again, I think you know we can't we I just, you know, have I just some lost vision of the future in I just that lost way. Some, oops, yeah, uh, have you're, some yeah, sense you're okay now, yeah. Of how the you know my action has a direct relationship. It's tiny, perhaps, but it's the butterfly right. effect as well. Um, we know that complex systems, um, you know, are susceptible to small variations in the conditions. Yeah, so, so we have technology and data now to do that, right? I mean, we could create an app that yeah. basically says, if I were to take an action, maybe sliding, you know, a scale, one way or the other, what is the net impact, you know, let's say carbon footprint or something like that, yeah. right? Uh, we, we have all the data to do that now. The question is, would people find that interesting? I mean, we are a little bit you know, sort of taking a detour from your research, but uh, no, would, would fine. people find, find that really useful? I what know a you? lot of people. I've been speculating on creating this little app and uh, working with a young developer on this project. And, you know, I know that for young people, it feels very, it feels very urgent, mm. right? Mm. It feels very urgent. And um, I mean, even for old people like some of my peers, um, <laughs> the idea of this kind of um, just feedback, you know, think about, you know, th think about how much people became addicted to Fitbits. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I, I'm not, you know, I, 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 I don't use one. I, you know, I, I exercise every day. I lead a good lifestyle and so forth. But there's that kind of um, training that people sort of get into if they have a feedback loop. And I actually think it'd be interesting to test whether or not, you know, little Carby, you know, little, you know, right. this little app um, would actually help people retrain their behaviors. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, Joanna, that um, we could even have a, you know, if you put in what you eat mm -hmm. and how much you exercise every day, we could even have an app that computes an A1C. Mm -hmm. for you, right, without yeah. doing a blood test, right, yeah. because yeah. it's all mathematically driven, really, um, yeah. and so, so yeah, I mean, we have all the technology, but I, I think technology has gone a little bit further than people, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, and uh, the question is, how do we make it practical? Yeah. Right, how do you make it practical, and how do you make it, you know, where's the motivation, where's the payoff, where's the benefit? 
And, um, you know, do you get credits of some kind, you know, even if they're just karma credits, right? Do you, do you get some kind of, you know, reward? And um, so anyway, I think these are definitely things to speculate about. But um, maybe I'm just um, old fashioned and optimistic, but I do think that knowledge is empowering. And I think when you give people more specific access to knowledge in relationship to their own actions, behaviors and circumstances, it you know, it, it, it may not necessarily determine what they do, but it provides a platform for decision making that I think, you know, is more informed. Yeah, so, so I think knowledge is sort of a strategic, but decision making is more tactical. So in, in some sense, you know, what everybody needs is if, if so let's say I'm faced with a binary decision, I want to know what the cost and benefit are of picking X as opposed to Y. Right. So right now I don't really have a way to do that, right? I mean, I, I go to a restaurant, I order, you know, order a steak um, as opposed to something else. If I have a, I, if I have a way to sort of measure the, the cost benefit ratio yeah. of that decision, maybe I make a different decision. That's right, I, I do think so. And, um, you know, I mean, I think about food labeling and the impact it had, um, you know, and I think it did change certain people's behaviors, um, you know, just to know what was in what was in what you were buying um, and what you were consuming. So I don't know. I mean, I, I would like to hold on to at least some shred of optimism <laughs> about the possibility of human beings actually setting themselves on a course to survival and social justice. I mean, I, I teach a course on sustainability um, within the, you know, a Masters of Library and Information Studies department. <clears throat> and, you know, our department has a very strong social justice mission. And I keep tell, saying to the students, you can't have social justice without environmental justice. They're very much linked to each other. So again, you know, how, how this is ethics again. You know, how do we how do we make best use of the intellectual tools we have, whether it's data, statistics, visualization, feedback loops, technology, to give people the option to actually, you know, do things that are, you know, not just for their own good, but for the, you know, common good. Mm. Yeah, I haven't thought about this, Joanna. So there's a larger ethical question. So if somebody's holding on to data, let's say, that might make a larger population, not make, but allow a larger population make better decisions, let's say. If that entity is not putting that data out in a fashion that's internalizable, is there an ethical question? Is it an ethical question? Yeah, I think so. so let, me, let me make it more tangible. So let's say, you know, I have information uh, about meat consumption as, oppo as opposed to non meat consumption. And there's uncertainty around that. None of this information is actually precise. There's some certainty. But if I hold that information, is it ethical for me to hold that information? Um, Am I obligated to provide that information to the larger masses? You know, so I don't know if I'm I'm articulating this correctly. I mean, we have a lot of data now. You know, data is everywhere. I mean, you you pose a question, we can answer that question using data, right? So why is that we are missing information in the larger public? So, well, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the question is always in whose interest is it to either offer the information or keep it concealed? And we have many documented examples, right? We can look at the tobacco industry. It's yeah. not as if it was a secret that, you know, smoking caused cancer, right? It's not a matter of will it cause cancer? It's a matter of when will it cause cancer if you're a smoker, right? You may outlive it. And you may not get die from the cancer, but you know it is a direct consequence. And the you know the tobacco industry knew this, and so again, I think we can we can look at examples of the way in which public information campaigns have resulted in transformations of policies, regulations, and used information effectively to make those changes. 
Um, I'm not terribly optimistic, given the current cultural climate, um, that the, that those directions are the ones that are going to be followed at the moment. But again, I, I I refuse to give up on the belief that you know what is ethical is also just, and that you know we must pursue it, um, even if it's a tilting, you know, even if it's an uphill battle. Um, so you know, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, I had one of your colleagues from UCSF on, and he was talking about obesity and metabolic syndrome, metabolic diseases. Uh, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, as you know, is about half of our healthcare costs, which is at $4.5 trillion per year. Uh, not, not a pocket change anymore. Um, and so obesity is a big deal, and we know what causes obesity. Uh, so. Tobacco, we know who makes the, the to bad tobacco products. We also know who makes the, the bad obesity products, but we haven't done anything about it. You know, it, it, it hasn't going on for the past 50 years. Yeah. Well, there is some action in the EU. Um, you know, I think it's in, it's, it might be in the UK, not, might not be the EU, it might be the UK to remove um, junk food uh, from supermarket shelves, put more regulations on the sale. Um, you know, an easy way to do this is tax. If you, you know, if you, if you tax, if you tax things that are damaging to a certain degree, um, you know, that's, I mean, that's what partly what was done with cigarettes was the, you know, cost was put up so high that it did serve as somewhat of a deterrent. Um, you know, I'm not a behavior modification specialist um, and I have enough vices of my own, you know, so <laughs> I'm willing to give up some, you know. I always tell my students what you want to do is be healthy enough to support your vices. So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, policy, you know, uh, I mean, we could talk about this forever, Joanna, but uh, I'll, I'll go into another another topic. But policy appears to be pretty straightforward in the sense that, as you say, if you fully internalize societal costs into taxes, then you get the right behavior, really. I mean, you, you can think about gas, you can think about soda, you can think about hamburgers or, you know, whatever you can think about. Um, if you fully internalize costs into taxes, you probably have a better societal outcome. Yeah. But our politics, I don't think, will allow that. So I sort of left in the cold here. Um, so, so I want to go into a story that you have written in 2018 called Downdrift. And you say kangaroos, foxes, dolphins, and many other animals take on, <laughs> take on human characteristics and behaviors. Um, so, so I just read the abstract. It's really fascinating. Um, so you want to talk a bit about that, uh, about the story? Sure, absolutely. Um, so Downdrift is actually narrated by an Archean, and the Archaea are the oldest existing living creatures on Earth. Um, they go back 3.6 billion years, which is a long time before any other species. So I'm not sure when photo photosynthesis starts, but it's a little bit afterwards. But the archaea, um, you know, are arc streamophiles. They can live in interstellar space. They can live by the marina trench in, you know, the ocean rifts. They can live in the back of furnaces. So they have incredible capacity um, to, uh, to sustain themselves. And it's partly because of their membrane structure. Um, they, their membrane structure is very basic, but very strong. And so they can resist heat and salt and, you know, all the, uh, the, the things that more permeable membranes are susceptible to. And so I used the archaea in this book as a kind of network, almost the way people are studying fungi. So I gave the archaea kind of characteristics, or probably more like, you know, fungi networks, um, as a kind of a combination of unique unicellular points of, of, of life and a kind of distributed sentience, um, a kind of network that's able to pick up on and be aware of conditions, you know, throughout the globe, um, throughout the earth. And so the story is told by an Archean, um, and who, because of its age, its collective and individual age, um, is able to have a long view on the way in which uh, climate change <laughs> is occurring and is um, telling these stories about um, things that are happening to animals as a result of climate change. 
And the typical um, animal uplift story is one in which animals take on human characteristics in this kind of positive way. But I wanted this to be the opposite. It's called downdrift because the notion is that these qualities of humans are seeping into the animal kingdom and causing all kinds of peculiar aberrations. And, um, but you know, it was just great fun to write. It, I mean, it's a sad story because it's a story about, you know, extinction and loss, but it was great fun because um, each of these animals has a different kind of role or character. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the pigs become, for instance, very, very good at politics. And, you know, they hold for it. Yeah. Right. And I suggest, for instance, that the dogs take over the Department of Motor Vehicles because they're much better at running the Department of Motor Vehicles than people because they don't care how long they're there. And when people show up and they're in line, they go, isn't this great? We're all here. Isn't this fun? And so it was a way of thinking about, um, you know, these, uh, the, these kind of fantasy transformations. Yeah. So a um, little bit of a tangent. So we domesticated all these animals, dogs, cats, pigs, those things. And I wondered sometimes what they were. I mean, and, uh, we know dogs were wolves before cats were some sort of wild cats or whatever. I don't know what pigs were. Um, but humans sort of took them and re-engineered them right, to, to, to be what they are today. So what they're today is sort of a, a fake of what they used to be, right, in some sense? Yeah, I mean, well, one theory is that, in fact, the relationship between dogs and humans was very reciprocal that in a sense they domesticated us for their purposes as well, that you know, there's a kind of symbiotic relationship there that everybody benefits. Um, and uh, I mean, obviously some animals were much more subject to the kind of control of, of human, the human species than others. Um, and you know, it's an ar we can argue and whether or not cats have ever really been fully domesticated. <laughs> There's they don't a, think so. They don't think there's so. a reason why we don't live with big cats. Okay. <laughs> if you notice, we live with big dogs and big horses, but we do not live with big cats. Right. And um, so, you know, the, the, but, you know, I love the animals and I live with animals. And, um, you know, I think uh, it's the, I, I mean, I think species awareness is transforming uh, as well. And, you know, often, again, one of the other, m one of my other thoughts is that, you know, we will be held to account by later generations for the abuse of species that we permit in our culture at this time. The cruelty industries of, you know, meat production, the, you know, a complete, you know, just sort of awful circumstances under which we, you know, keep animals for our own use at a industrial scale. Um, it's not necessary to to work at that scale. I mean, much of, again, this goes back to all the things we were just talking about, you know, in whose interest is it for the monocultures of the world to function at the scale they function? Well, there's efficiencies of scale, for sure, but there's also an obliteration that that allows individuals to have, where you don't have to see the suffering of the animal, you just see it on your plate. And, you know, so um, I can't bear to see suffering, you know, and uh, so if, you know, I think confronted with this um, reality, um, you know, people's behaviors transform. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a tangent. I want to get your perspective on this. So you mentioned this, you know, how would future gener generations rate us? And, you know, when, when I look back, I say there's a group of people who's burning the oxygen in their greenhouse as fast as they can. They're going to choke to death. Meanwhile, there are two billionaires who wants to make Mars great again. Um, I hope that works out. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know the technology. Um, it, it seems sort of archaic and... Um, I don't know what the right term. I mean, they will look back to us and say, "What is wrong with these people?" Yeah, and you know, it's really strange. One of the great mysteries of humankind is why humans will 
act against their own best interests. <laughs> well, I mean, if they knew, uh, I look at humans as sort of not that intelligent animal. Um, you know, their, their objective yeah. functions appear to be very limited, you know, um, um, food, sex, shelter. Uh, it appears very, very limited uh, optimization problem. So they're not fundamentally that much more intelligent than most animals that we meet, right? And so I don't think we can go any further <laughs> than than what we have been, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm pessimistic there's, about it. There's some evidence that in fact, the human species is less intelligent in terms of cognitive capacities than it was about, you know, sort of two to 3000 years ago that the, the late Bronze Age um, and some of the early Iron Age is a period in which human resourcefulness, creativity, innovation, and general knowledge of how to do things was much greater than it has become subsequent to that. And um, uh, I have a real interest in human evolution and um, you know uh, hominids and so forth. And some years ago, I went with a, a friend um, to visit the caves in uh, France and Northern Spain. And there was a wonderful um, uh, Neolithic culture museum, living museum. And the guide there was showing you know, how to throw a spear and how to chip flints and so forth. And, you know, of course, the, the, you know, there are very few contemporary humans who can do any of those things. And, you know, it's like we would starve to death if we had to hunt a mammoth in a group. Okay. Um, you know, it's like, totally. the way we could do it. And again, I, I think we, you know, I'm, I'm totally willing to believe that we have diminished our capacities. I mean, I, I, you may know this from where you sit in, in your own professional life, but the medical schools say that they're having a great deal of difficulty training surgeons because students come in with no knowledge of hand activity. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, as we, as children, we learned how to do painting and repair work and a little bit of woodworking and cooking and knitting. And I sewed all my own clothes and, you know, just, and it's not like we were little geniuses, quite the contrary, but that was an integral part of children's education. Right. And it no longer is. Um, you know, swiping with mm -hmm. your thumb is not a very sophisticated hand-eye coordination. Wow. Yeah, th that's such an amazing thing. Um, yeah, that's a good reason, Joe, and I never became a surgeon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and as an engineer, I never built anything. I never used oh. my hands. I oh. used mathematics. Um, oh. So, so I think we are slowly progressing toward. Uh, yeah, that's a, such an interesting concept, you know, in a broad sense, right? Not just in medicine, but also in engineering and uh, in other areas, right? We have computers, we have algorithms, we have stuff that we can create that does things for us, like our pets, so to speak. So we can create an you know, algorithmic pet, for for instance, but we cannot put them in a leash and, you know, uh, move them around. We don't really think about that, right? So so at some point, our, I would imagine our motor skills will decline uh, to such an extent that we don't have to move anymore. We right. just have to think. Right. Right. I mean, we have to cultivate exercise. It's not integrated into our daily routines. So if you are, you know, working a garden and you are, you know, tending animals and you are, you know, pulling water and you are, you know, building furniture and, you know, any of these things, exercise is simply part of your life. You don't have to say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to get up now for an hour and go for a walk around the block and so, you know, this all of this came out of your question about what will future generations think? Uh, how will they judge us? And, uh, you know, it's um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I don't think we'll come off so well, you know, in terms of uh, what decisions we made, you know. Um, well, we, we seem to be in transition. So it's not just exercise. So think about autonomous vehicles, right? So driving was a skill that you learned and you got better at it over time. 
So now we have auto, you know, level five autonomous cars. So essentially you get into the car, doesn't have a steering wheel anymore. So the car drives you. So that skill is going to be lost over time, completely lost, which may not be a bad thing. We have the same thing going on aircrafts. So many of the aircraft accidents that happened last five, 10, 15 years are related to the fact that the human sort of did a mistake the machine was perfectly fine. The machine would have driven the aircraft perfectly well, but the human gets in there and you know does something, and then that that creates a problem. So we have this human machine interaction issue that's going on as well. Um, but I don't think our our the next generation will look back to us and say these guys were really smart. I, I don't. <laughs> don't think so. Not unless. Yeah, not unless we take advantage of these engineering transformations, technological transformations, to really rethink what constitutes well-being. What constitutes well-being for individuals, for groups, for families, for communities, and, you know, for people as a whole. And when I, you know, again, I live in Los Angeles, we have a lot of hardscape here. And, you know, the hardscape is here because, you know, the cars want it. And so what, what are the alternatives, you know, rewilding, urban forestry, urban gardening, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the ways in which our entire sort of path dependency lifestyle, you know, sort of structures could be rethought radically um, so that, you know, it's like, well, what, so I know people are worried about robots, right, and, and automation, but I'd say if a job can be done by a robot, why should a human being do it? Right. I mean, if, if it's a matter of some very mechanical, repetitive action, but there are things that human beings love to do. They love to make music. They, mm. you know, they, they love to make music. They love to dance. They love to eat good food. Some of us like to be left alone. Some of us like to be with others. Some of us like to, to tell stories. Right. To. So what are the things that, you know, humans could do it? We don't need wage labor the way that we used to have it. We need to rethink the ways in which, you know, work contributes to well-being in the physical sense, in the personal sense. So, you know, I'm a physical person. Um, I mean, I spent a lot of time in my head, but I'm a physical person. I like to do things physically um, and it makes me feel good. And I think it's healthy um, and, you know, healthy in the sense that it, it makes me feel good. It's just it's that basic. So, you know, the other side of this um, is the whole sort of, you know, understanding of distributed cognition. The cognition is not a mental process. It is a it is a complex interaction between a body, a world, a world that returns information to the body, through the body. Um, you know, there's a, and through interfaces um, and machines and so forth. So cognition, we tend to, you know, get this idea that, you know, cognition is what goes on in people's heads, but it's what goes on in a body in relationship to an environment in a dynamic, interactive way. So I think these are all, you know, sort of areas where the opportunity to re radically rethink um, the way that we live as human beings is quite possible. Um, but, you know, there are obstacles to this that are ideological, political, and have to do with control of resources and so forth. I mean, we know that. We know. We know. We know what causes these, um, you know, distortions. Yeah. So, so I want to ask you sort of a policy question. So I know that you have thought a lot about these types of things. So, I'm a big fan of uh, minimum guaranteed wages. Yeah. Um, I think I strongly believe that we are moving into a regime where um, humans. Uh, humans are going to be rated very inefficient compared to machines, and we're going to have a large surplus in terms of productivity. So the question is, how do we distribute that productivity to all the humans, you know, not just a few billionaires who wants to make Mars great again, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so, so there, there's sort of a, the policy question around this, right? So, so what, what is your, what is your feeling about that? Um, well, first of all, I have to say the phrase "make Mars great again" has an uncomfortable resonance with some other phrases that I would prefer that we not use. Um, and it's not clear to me that Mars had a great golden age that we're reviving. But, we don't um, know. We don't know. We don't have, we don't have the history. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, I mean, look, what makes people good citizens? Being homeowners. 
right? You become a stakeholder. You own, you own some property, you have a stake in the community, right? right. So again, um, these things are not big mysteries in terms of psychological motivation. And, um, you know, it's not, I agree with you that it's not necessary for, um, you know, labor forces to compete for um, a sustainable living wage. That is ridiculous, right? That is simply exploitation. That is, you know, a form of abuse that ends up introducing strife and difficulty into cultures in ways that end up mapping onto race, gender, ethnicity, religion. So, you know, there's no benefit, no benefit at all to continuing that system. Right. Yeah, and I mean, we are in a position uh, very close to it that we can provide a tremendous amount of leisure to all the all the humans, all yeah. 8 billion of them, right? Yeah. If, we, if we do it properly, I mean, it, it, it's a problem is, a, a small percentage of this population want to essentially get all the premia associated with that activity. And that has been the history of humans. And yeah. I, I don't think it's going to change, but if we were to really become a sort of a level two society, we could we could really distribute the benefits coming out of automation yeah. to everybody, right? That's and, right. And there are models for this. I mean, not so much in an automated, uh, technologically advanced culture, but look at the Indus Valley civilization from 2500 BCE. Very integrated, very balanced. You know, there there was a there was a, a a good balance between what the agricultural technology could support, what people needed, and and how the distribution of access to resources was working. So, you know, it's not as if there aren't examples of the way that this can work. We don't want to romanticize, you know, sort of, um, you know, Stone Age culture, because frankly, you know, disease, hygiene, um, you know, fashion choices, were not, <laughs> not as interesting. Right. Um, you know, so again, there, there are things about contemporary modern civilization that are, you know, a great benefit. It's a question of how those benefits are going to be, you know, redistributed, structured in order to, you know, provide for well-being and real well-being. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point, uh, important point, which is, um, so, you know, in some uh, cohorts where humanity has headed as sort of a, you know, kind of planned society idea, and, and we know planned societies don't work, we want competition, we want people to, you know, sort of push themselves to what they want to do. And nobody is smart enough to plan anything, <laughs> you know, is what we have learned over the last uh, at least 5,000 years. So uh, there is this question of, you know, this competing ideas, which is, so So, what would be sort of the, I mean, this is way outside what, what you have talked about the paper, but what is sort of the, the societal structure that you would want for this to work? You know, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, uh, you know, democratic socialism is the best solution that we have come up with. And, you know, if you look at the countries of, you know, Scandinavia, you know, they, there are things about those cultures that work very, very well. There are things that don't work so well. And, um, you know, an insular, fairly homogenous society has certain kinds of ways of working that are more difficult to, you know, kind of extend into more diverse and multicultural environments. But again, I, you know, I don't, I, my feeling is if, if human beings feel that they have access to education, you know, healthcare, um, the possibility of advancing their own individual goals so that they can realize them, whatever they are, whether it's having a family or having a career or making a contribution or, you know, it's like it doesn't, it, 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 it's, you know, the problem in, in uh, our current American culture is that many people are disenfranchised from that completely. You know, I mean, I grew up in center city, Philadelphia and went to public schools all my life except for two and a half years of art school. All the rest of my education was public public education, public universities. And, you know, it's like, I came from a, a not particularly advantaged background, except I had bright parents, but, you know, we didn't have money. It was like, but it was possible. There was a kind of level playing field. There was the possibility of entering into, um, you know, the mainstream in a way that felt fair. 
And I know there's a lot of arguments against meritocracies and all kinds of things. So, but again, it, it's it's not about a meritocracy. It's about a fairness. Um, we do not have enough good vocational education. Mm. We don't honor our our vocational workers. Um, you know, we who's going to do who's going to do contracting? Who's going to do gardening? Who's going to do plumbing? You can't outsource plumbing, in case anybody hasn't noticed. Okay. <laughs> you know? Right. It's, so. Yeah. So the, the German apprentice system appears to be quite quite interesting. You talk about Scandinavia. I always felt that there's a scale problem there. So we can, you know, we can think about Norway, Finland, Sweden. We can think about New Zealand. We can think about South Korea. Um, when you have less than 10 million people, that are sort of uniform in nature. Uh, it's a different problem than, you know, yeah. 330 million in the U.S., 1.4 billion in India, and you know, it's it's a really different problem. So the, the question of scalability hasn't been proven, I think. That's true, but again, you know, I don't think that the social issues we're facing are because of a, of a, of a deficit of resources. I think we have the resources. And for instance, people who do um, analysis of food supply in the global environment, it's a, they all say it's a political issue, not an ecological issue at present. It has to do with you know, resources distribution, knowledge, access. And th so I really think that, again, there are, there are very you know, bright people who have envisioned ways of making you know, transformations that would you know, again, I, I believe in education. I think it's cr crucial, um, but uh, education must lead to, you know, a way of life that's fair. And again, you know, it can't lead to, you know, a 30 year debt for somebody who's graduating from college who therefore is excluded from entering into home ownership, equity, part full, full participation really in adult life. I mean, what, what are we doing? What are we thinking to be doing this? So, you know, those are problems we can solve. We could solve the problem of student debt. That is not an unsolvable problem. And that's no, 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 able that, to be scaled. Yeah, I mean, the policies are very clear. I mean, if you were to invest into a student, the return on that to society is extremely high. Uh, but we don't do that. We, right. we actually... Um, and the student actually pays six, seven, eight percent. I have a daughter just uh, finishing a medical school. <laughs> I know, I know, I know what that uh, what that looks like. Um, so, so I want to go into something uh, slightly different. So, you have this book, Alphabet Histories, and and you are actually creating a book around this. So it's a study of the origin of letters from antiquity to the present. So, alphabets. Uh, so. Um, one deficiency I have, Joanna, is that I know nothing about language. Uh, <laughs> so, so how did how did the alphabet start, and uh, how, how did it progress? Sure. Um, okay, so this is a topic I've worked on for forty years. So, if you start asking me questions, we might be here for forty years. But um, just in a nutshell. Um, most people don't understand what the alphabet is. They'll you ask them say something about the alphabet, they say what alphabet, which alphabet, our alphabet, the Greek alphabet. So the alphabet that's in use throughout the you know globe um, and undergirds the internet and electric you know networked communication originated in the ancient Near East in a cultural exchange between the kind of cuneiform based um, you know language uh, cultures in uh, ancient um, uh, Chaldea and Canaan, all along the Mediterranean coast of the Levant into North Africa. And that entire region, which is where language um, and writing first developed in a systematic way, first with um, you know these kind of tokens um, in around 10,000 BCE, work done by Denishma, Besserat, and so forth. But the writing systems from which the alphabet derives um, are a synthesis of understanding of the structure of language and a symbol set to represent it. And that emerges around 1700, 1800 BCE in the region between modern day Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, and North Africa, Egypt. 
And that entire region, by the time the alphabet is emerging, was comprised of Afro-Asiatic speakers. Um, the Afro-Semitic languages dominate that region. And of the five major language groups in that region, four were Semitic. Um, Egyptian is the exception. It's not a Semitic language, but it's part of this Afro-Asiatic language group. So the alphabet stabilizes as a, as a system and then is adapted through spread around the Mediterranean to begin with by the Phoenician traders who were you know, uh, all over that region. And then it also spreads south into Ethiopia where it gets adapted and transformed. It goes into India and the whole Asian you know, subcontinent. It goes north um, and east. And there are deliberate modifications and interventions like St. Cyril in the fourth century modifies the alphabetic symbols to work better for um, Slavic languages. But the alphabet goes into Greece by, by um, land routes um, through Turkey and Asia Minor. And then it also comes by sea. And it also ends up in southern Italy, southern Spain, um, North Africa. And so little the by same, little. Same platform? Same it's platform. all the same alphabet. And the way we know this is the sequence of letters, the number of letters, their names, and what we call their powers. And the powers of letters are the sounds to which they are attached. So little by little, just like cuisine or fashion or other cultural activities, these things become modified in their regions, just like a language dialect. Right. So think about the multiple dialects in India. Right. And so th and then those are the result of local specializations. Things get, you know, isolated in a pocket and then they develop and so forth. So the alphabet develops. The alphabet that's used, you know, throughout most of Europe is, of course, a, a variant of the Latin alphabet, um, which was, you know, partly developed in relation to the Greek, but also an independent development there on the, you know, um, uh, in the tip of Italy and so forth. There were several other writing systems that existed, but went away um, in Crete, um, in India, there's an Indus Valley script. But aside from alphabetic based scripts, which really are, you know, international in, in their use, there are only character-based scripts in existence. So Chinese, Japanese, the Hangul script in Korea, um, and a few, very few deliberate inventions like Vi and Cherokee and Cree. So, but the alphabet is global, it's worldwide, and sometimes it gives me chills when I realize that these symbols that were scratched on little rocks in the Sinai, right, you know, sort of almost 4,000 years ago, are what's on my computer keyboard today. It's like, oh, that's intense that that's still there. Yeah. That was an invention, a uh, huge innovation, right? Um, so, but, but the, the Egyptian hieroglyphics and all that stuff, so how does that relate to alphabets? Sure. Well, Egyptian hieroglyphics emerge around 2700, 2800 BCE and quite developed from the very beginning. One of the interesting things is we have almost no examples of kind of primitive Egyptian writing. So one of the questions is, how, how is that possible? What does that mean? Um, and, uh, you know, and then um, the in the in the Tigris Euphrates Valley, the first writing that appears is, um, as writing is Sumerian pictographs. Now, Sumerians spoke a language that's not related to the other languages in the region, and the pictographs don't really get adopted, but cuneiform develops, and it becomes the lingua franca. I mean, the writing script that's used all over the ancient Near East, because it's mm -hmm. adaptable to multiple different languages. And this is also one of the interesting things. Scripts don't map onto languages. So mm -hmm. you can have Finno-Hungarian, which is not related to the Latin language, the Romance languages, and not related to the Semitic languages, and they can all use alphabetic signs to be represented. Mm -hmm. So different languages can still use the alphabet. It's true with Chinese characters as well. The characters are legible even if they're used for different languages, and that makes them able to be read across language groups. So so the, the original innovation was, was it connecting, um, uh, connecting alphabets to make meaning? Is that the original innovation? Yeah, the original innovation, I mean, first you have writing, right? You have record keeping systems. Yeah. And we have yeah. ancient record keeping systems. You know, people will, in the cave, 
even in the caves, you know, 30,000 years ago are keeping track of the phases of the moon or they're keeping track of how many dates they had in the cave. We don't really know what, was, yeah. what they're keeping track of, but they're keeping track of something in a systematic way. Um, and uh, But, you know, record keeping emerges with urban culture and bureaucracy in the ancient Near East. And that's that's the Denise Mont Bezrat work. When you can store commodities, hard grains, brewed fermented beverages, oil, then you want some system for keeping track of it, ownership. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the beginnings. But then the attachment to language comes as the and this is really intellectually mind boggling as human beings begin to understand the phonetic structure of language, the sound structure. So, you know, again, it's like if I said if I if, if I gave you a language you didn't understand and I said, OK, sit down and analyze its basic sounds. You know, what are what are its significant sound features, sounds that are distinct one from another so that, you know, they're significant in your language. Those are called significant features in phonetic terms. And they're very similar in all languages, right? Well, they're, they're similar to some extent, but then this is why we get modifications. Okay. There are sounds that were represented for Old English by the, mm. the thorn and the yod, two symbols that have fallen out of use for mm. modern English. Right. That's why the Cyrillic alphabet, the Armenian alphabet, um, you know, were uh, modified. Um, and the Greek alphabet was modified because the Greek spoke an Indo-European language, not a Semitic language. So they needed a more explicit notation system for vowels. So there's always modifications. But um, what's really amazing is that capacity to analyze the sounds. So that by the time you get to 1400 BCE, there's a very famous Ugaritic cuneiform syllabary um, that is, uh, you know, comprised of a limited number, maybe it's 27 or 29 signs that can represent the language that's being spoken in, 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 you know, Ugarit in that region. Yeah. It's incredible, you know. I, I find the subject so fascinating because I know nothing about it. Um, <laughs> So, so, so how was uh, what was sort of number number systems stuff like that was connected to uh, alphabets at some point? Oh, the history of counting systems is utterly fascinating, and they're quite varied. Um, there's even a counting system that's on base seventeen, and that's based on different, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. It's, it's an upper body. Seventeen will be really difficult. It's so I know, yes. Imagine calculating everything in base seventeen. Um, that way, that would keep your mind limber and young. So. Um, so counting systems develop, you know, again, uh, there's, you know, there, there are correla correlations. The, you know, the symbol sets that are used for, for numbers in um, the sort of earliest cuneiform, um, first they correspond to, to directly. If you want to show three of something, you do it three times. But then what's amazing intellectually is the leap to being able to represent threeness as a concept. Think about it. It always blows me away. It's like, I can understand three things. And you see this with children. I'm sure you've watched it with, with, with your children, right? It's like, there's a point where they go from the literal representation of quantity to an abstraction where they understand that there's quantities that can be represented. Right. Mind boggling. That's a huge, huge leap. Yeah. Huge leap. Yeah. So, yeah, this is, this is, this is really good. Um, and so, I know that you're teaching at UCLA, so uh, I want to conclude with, you know, sort of when you look at, you know, kids that, that you're teaching um, over time, um, do you see do you see any difference? Uh, do you see, I mean, we are in a very competitive world, you know, we have engineers, we have medical <laughs> folks, uh, we have investment bankers, we have economists, I mean, they're all running for something. They often don't get there. Um, so when you teach your students, what are they really aspiring to? Um, do you see a difference over time? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been teaching full time for 40 years, so I have definitely some, seen some changes. The downside is, I think, the capacity to concentrate, to yeah. read, to become absorbed. 
in work, that has diminished. And I think one of the things I try to do is to engineer assignments that give students access to the pleasure of concentration, to the pleasure of engagement with work. And, you know, if you can get them to start down a rabbit hole where they don't want to stop, you know, then it's like you've given them access to a mode of engaging with knowledge that they can make use of in any other domain. Um, so, you know, I, um, in addition to the intellectual things I teach, I have for many years taught letterpress. And I also teach drawing. And um, so you teach letterpress. Letterpress is handset type. And we have a tiny little studio. And when the doors are open there, the students come, they look in, and they just can't believe it. It's like Wonderland. And so they come in, and they 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 say things like, "Well, maybe I could maybe I could print my my master's thesis." And I said, "Well, why don't you come and print a paragraph first? <laughs> mm -hmm. But they come in, and they pick up the composing stick, and they have this case of type in front of them. And they start to pick out the letters and begin to work. Again, goes back to working with the hands. And they get lost. They get completely lost. Hours will go by, right? And they won't have looked at their phones. And, you know, they won't have felt the need for yet another bottle of water and cup of coffee. And so, you know, that capacity for absorption, for engagement with the real pleasure of intellectual or creative work, that's yeah. the thing that I think they have difficulty accessing because of the distraction economy, right? Everything is always a distraction. So that is my main goal as a teacher is to provide an experience that transforms their relationship to work. Right. Yeah, sometimes we are too hard on ourselves. You know, the liberal arts education we have in this country is significantly superior to, and I, I can vouch to this because I, I grew up in a different uh, different culture. Um, so I, I, you know, it was all engineering and economics for me my entire life. Um, I, so the, the liberal arts education that we have in this country is, is really important for us to continue to nourish, make it better. Because I think from an education perspective, that's really the competitive advantage that we have because the the Indians and the Chinese and the Russians are going to catch on to the engineering stuff. I mean, they're pretty good at that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it is the innovation, the creative thinking, the ability to sort of merge things together. That is our competitive advantage. So that is that is where we have to focus on, I think. Yeah, well, the humanities are what make us human. And, you know, having access to ways of thinking um, about how we think and what we think about is still really crucial. Um, I mean, it sort of goes back to where we started from with the ethics of the ethics of aesthetics, because what is aesthetics? I mean, aesthetics is that branch of philosophy that has to do with perception. Right. But how do we understand what we're perceiving? How do we have access to experience? Right. If you live a formulaic existence in which your sense of how to have experience is based on TikTok and, you know, but, I mean, I have nothing against TikTok, but the point is that, you know, if your sense of experience is that it should be under five minutes and it should be on this size screen and it should have this kind of performance in it, then, you know, what I see in my morning, you know, run around the neighborhood is that people are looking at their screens. They're not listening to the world they're not hearing the world they're not in missing a, something yeah missing in a sense something. they yeah. don't have access to experience as a primary aesthetic mode right so this to me is again um you know something to access something something that you know i want to pass on to future generations when 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 you and i get done re-engineering the world <laughs> now that we've made our good policy plans it will include the capacity to simply be in the world and enjoy it to to watch the changing color of light and the sky in the morning to to hear you know whatever the sounds are that you're passing through to feel a sense of space around you to to sense the smell on any particular day that lets you know is it how long has it been since it rained you know is the earth opening up are are plants suddenly reviving can you are, are you getting you know all of the things that 
connect us as human beings to the world we live in. So, uh, you know, again, I know I'm sounding like Pollyanna and very optimistic, but, you know, I do think, um, you know, the thing I notice with students is if you give them the opportunity to access that capacity for absorption and engagement, that transforms their lives in a way that nothing you teach them in terms of subject matter does. Right. It has to be experiential. It really has to be experiential. Yeah. Now, I thought of saying, Joanna, that we got 30,000 years, every human being at the most, it's a 30,000 years, 30,000 days, sorry. Oh, okay. 30, I was going to say. 30,000 days, you know, every minute, every day is sort of moving by. You have to really focus on what you want to accomplish, right? And, um, you could be running your entire life, you know, trying to get to something and, you know, and the time lapses and then you got nothing. Right. So, so I, I'm not as optimistic as you, do. I think. Well, I'm not I, optimistic you know. at all, but I, I do feel <laughs> that I had, I've had the privilege of having work to do that, that seems like it matters. And, you know, in the end, I think it is the, the teaching, um, modeling behavior, offering, offering experience is the most important work that I've been able to do. Excellent. I mean, I've yeah. written a lot of books, but. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Joanna. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Well, thank you so much for being in touch. And I know we could go on talking more and more, um, but I think we've talked more than enough. And I appreciate so much your attention and engagement. Yeah, we could we could talk about this for days. I yeah. Would <laughs> yeah. So 